dear friends and uh, colleagues. Good evening to all of you and welcome to this AORA accredited webinar supported by Sonosite Fujifilm. Uh, this uh, webinar was uh, created to educate all of us on various aspects of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this being uh, the last uh, lecture of this series, there is likely to be uh, some um, repetition of uh, content uh, because earlier speakers would have spoken on this fairly new topic. So aspects may be repeated. I apologize for the same in advance. I'll base my lecture on my uh, limited uh, experience and um, also um, certain review articles that were published in peer-reviewed and index journals in the recent past. I am an old timer. I pretty much uh, prefer standing at a podium and uh, addressing live audiences, but in these days of uh, lockdown and social distancing, Physical meetings are not permissible, and hence a webinar is the app platform to have an interactive discussion on sci I mean, topics of scientific interest. Uh, before I talk of uh, perioperative management, uh, a small um, review of uh, relevant facts. Um, a pandemic, as we all know, is uh, an epidemic that occurs worldwide i'm sorry um, it crosses international boundaries and affects a large number of people it took its origins in uh, december 2019 in um, wuhan in uh, china most probably in the wet markets uh, wherein meats of exotic animals such as bats and pangolins were sold on January 30th, uh, the WHO declared it a public health emergency of international concern. And on Feb 11th, this virus was given the nomenclature of COVID-19 virus. When you can have a West Nile virus, when you can have a spotted Rocky Mountain spotted fever, an Ebola fever, which is named after the Ebola River in Central Africa, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, it beats my comprehension why this virus was not named the Wuhan virus. And uh, on March 11th, 2020, uh, the WHO chief, uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus, declared this as a pandemic. Now, a pandemic has the ability to kill large numbers of people, and it qualifies as a mass casualty incident. So the response to this incident is to be able to uh, ensure that there is long lasting financial resource and also human resource, which comprises of senior, well-trained and motivated professionals, which is why governments the world over have actually concentrated their efforts uh, into flattening the curve so that healthcare system capabilities are not overwhelmed all at once. Uh, a quick look at uh, the COVID-19 virus. It belongs to the family of beta coronaviruses. There is sustained human-to-human -human transmission, which has been very recent. It began only in December last year. Uh, the problem with this virus is that it has this ability to infect even while the patient is asymptomatic. Uh, approximately 3 million people uh, have been infected so far. The incubation period is typically three to seven days, and the case fatality rate in India is approximately 3.5%, whereas in Italy it went up to almost 13%, and in the United Kingdom it's about 10%. Male gender is a risk factor because the testes contain adequate amounts of ACE2 receptors, which are also present in abundance in the respiratory epithelium, myocardium, and the gastrointestinal tract. Other risk factors include extremes of age, hypertension, diabetes, 
any chronic illness involving uh, the heart, the kidney, or the central nervous system, patients who've suffered cancers and have had therapy for uh, treatment of cancers, and any patient who's been on immunosuppressant drugs. <clears throat> As far as uh, clinical presentation is concerned, uh, the typical symptoms are fever, uh, muscle weakness, myalgias, dry cough in the absence of a runny nose, sore throat. Dyspnea is something which is quite typical of this viral infection. Some patients have diarrhea and anosmia also has been reported in a few patients. It is interesting to note that 80% of those infected remain asymptomatic or only so mildly symptomatic that they will not even realize. About 15% will have a severe influenza-like illness necessitating hospitalization and possibly oxygen supplementation. Only about 5% of people will have severe acute respiratory infections which require critical care, mechanical ventilation, and supportive treatment. And it is this subset of patients comprising about 5% that are intensely prothrombotic, which calls for instituting anticoagulation in these patients from day one. Empirical therapies have been tried. We know that BCG vaccination is being touted as uh, providing additional immunity against this virus. But at this present point of time, it is only convalescent plasma transfusions that are showing some promise of reversing uh, the downfall with this particular infection. And the entire world is waiting with bated breath for an effective vaccine to be made available. So in the absence of credible treatment, all we are asked to do is maintain social distancing, avoid uh, touching the mouth, ear, and nose, and enhance personal hygiene uh, measures. Uh, people talk of herd immunity and how once at least 50% of uh, the population is exposed, it will uh, lead to a decline in the pandemic, but this will not uh, happen in uh, quick time. Uh, in the meantime, there has been so much information floating around on WhatsApp University that I'm sure all of us have developed H-E-A-R-D immunity. Uh, this probably was the first uh, paper which gave uh, practical recommendations uh, for anesthetists caring for this particular viral infection. It was followed soon after by this paper from um, the Chinese Society of Anesthesiologists. And thereafter, there were several papers uh, wherein others uh, delved into their own personal experiences to come up with certain recommendations which we follow today. So the question we need to ask is, why no elective surgery? Firstly, it is to protect a patient. A COVID negative patient may theoretically turn COVID positive during the course of hospitalization while undergoing an elective surgery. And the second aspect is that a symptomatic patient, because of perioperative stress, may have activated macrophages that lead to a cytokine storm and this patient's condition may deteriorate after a surgery. And it is also important to protect healthcare workers and make sure healthcare institutions don't turn into hotbeds of infection. It is interesting to note that the mortality rate in healthcare workers is 10 to 12%, which is very high. And the obvious reason is exposure to a higher viral load. So, we tend to take care of patients coming in for emergency surgeries of various kinds. Labor epidurals are okay, C-sections are okay, and also obviously oncosurgery because once a patient knows he or she is positive for a particular cancer, they do not want to wait uh, till the time the pandemic subsides. I will tread very, very carefully on this particular slide. 
why consider elective surgery now? One, the growth has at best been linear and not exponential as we feared. At the doubling rate, initially was about 3.5 days, it went up to 7.2 days, and today it is less than 10 days. As far as the primary wave is concerned, we are probably past the peak and we are definitely um, on the decline. And as control strings begin to loosen up, surgical indications are open to interpretation. Last month, a patient with an acute cholecystitis might have been advised antibiotics and surveillance. Today, the same surgeon will say, why don't we operate before this gallbladder bursts? Or the cystic duct gets blocked by a particular troublesome gallstone. Another example could be a patient with backache and extensor halysis longus weakness in one limb a month ago might have been advised bed rest and traction. Today, the same surgeon may say, why don't we operate before bladder dysfunction supervenes? Uh, the Union Health Ministry last week in a notification said that private hospitals may in fact resume normal services. This is because the union government and state governments across the country have commendably taken it upon themselves to both isolate and treat patients who are tested positive for COVID-19, which means that private healthcare facilities, which constitute more than 60% of healthcare facilities in this country, are not actually as active. So I think it is time we take certain steps towards performing elective surgeries going forward. But the caveat is that we take all possible precautions and we treat each patient as COVID positive until proven otherwise. <clears throat> Uh, this was uh, a meeting we held earlier this week at which uh, heads of various departments uh, were convened uh, so that we could have some sort of a consensus pathway both for both elective and emergency surgical procedures going forward. There are three T's when you talk of a contagious disease. One is testing, the second is tracing, and the last is treatment. As far as treatment is concerned, we know that there is no credible treatment so far. Tracing is being done by local authorities. And when it comes to testing, today we don't have antigen testing. We don't have rapid antibody kits because what were made available have been rejected by the ICMR because they were faulty. So today the current gold standard is uh, RT-PCR, which is real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, which actually tests the nucleic acid of the RNA of the virus. But even with this gold standard test, which is RT-PCR, the sensitivity is at best 70%. It is least with an oropharyngeal swab, slightly higher with a nasal swab, and approaches 90% when you take the swab from an endotracheal tube in a patient in the ICU. So this is the testing conundrum that we face today. Quite surprisingly, despite the risk of exposure to radiation and the cost involved, an HRCT of the chest is fast emerging as a very important diagnostic tool. Uh, this was a study that is in the press, and uh, it came from China, wherein with RT-PCR as the reference, the sensitivity of chest CT imaging for COVID-19 was as high as 97%. So after the discussion we had earlier this week with uh, various surgeons, we made it a protocol that an HRCT of chest, limited sequence, plain, at a subsidized cost would be made a part and parcel of both major surgical and minor surgical profiles for patients coming in for surgeries. 
So this was a study involving about 121 patients, as you see uh, in the column on the left. A majority of these patients had ground glass opacities, and uh, it was bilateral in a majority of patients, and lower lobes, again, were involved in a majority of patients. And on the right, you can see that uh, there are ground glass um, opacities, preferably inhabiting the peripheral areas of the lung. And as the disease progresses in sicker patients, you will have the reverse halo and crazy paving patterns also emerging on the HRCT pictures. <clears throat> when it comes to pre-anesthetic evaluation, uh, a history will obviously include epidemiological history, uh, we will ask for symptoms of COVID-19, also look at occupational exposure, focus on systemic comorbidities and drugs, especially immunosuppressants. Uh, we have to be able to assess the airway well because um, we don't have too many options at our disposal, as I will speak later. We must make an attempt to record room air oxygen saturation. Several of these patients have low oxygen sats, less than 90%, and they won't even know. I mean, a term that is being uh, coined to explain this um, uh, unexplained uh, hypoxia is happy hypoxia. So when it comes to investigations, WBC count is something we need to give uh, certain importance to because the patients can be either leukocytopenic or lymphopenic. C-reactive protein may be high. LDH begins to rise in um, very sick patients. <clears throat> Cardiac evaluation was talked uh, uh, in detail by Shekhar yesterday. Serum ferritin levels begin to rise in sicker ICU patients. And uh, ferritin is known to activate macrophages, which in turn worsens the existing cytokine storm. It has been seen that in patients with hyperferritinemic syndromes, the prognosis is much poorer. HRCT chest is something I spoke about. And it is always a good thing to monitor temperature prior to surgery on the morning of surgery. And if it is in excess of 37.3 degrees centigrade, it is best to postpone elective surgery. Uh, this is an informed consent form that uh, includes indemnity from the patient and their family. Uh, I must admit that I was inspired by the consent form shared to me uh, by my good friend Bala from Ganga Hospitals. In my opinion, PPE stands not only for personal protective equipment, but also personally painful experience. This will be dealt with in great detail by Bala and Hethel, so I'm not really going to talk about this. It is advised that we have a COVID operating area, which is designated to be closest to the OT entrance so that we avoid contamination of the rest of the operation theaters. As you can see in this particular picture, uh, patients will come in and exit through this door. This is the COVID corridor. The surgeons will, surgeons or all the operators involved in the surgery will doff their PPE in this room after the patient leaves. And this is the entrance to the designated COVID theater. And this is the COVID theater, and the patient will both enter and exit after the surgery. And this is the door which opens into the common corridor, and the operators involved in the surgery will be donning the PPEs in this corridor and make the entry into the theater through this door, after which this door will be locked and remain so till the patient leaves. And after donning, uh, sorry, doffing the PPEs or removing the PPEs, the operators will enter the common SICU corridor through this door. And this door has an air curtain on top. And as soon as the door opens, the air curtain gets activated. So it prevents spread of contagion into the common SICU corridor. As far as patient transfer is concerned, there must be a 
predefined direct path from the respiratory intensive care unit or the emergency or the isolation ward where the patient is being nursed. And prior to transfer, the security is notified so that there are no bystanders along the path when the patient is being transferred. We made it a protocol to cover the patient entirely with a plastic sheet so that in case the patient accidentally coughs, the dispersal of aerosol will be minimized. The transfer scheme will definitely don at least 11 to PPEs and they must be properly trained in transport and disinfection. Patients who are breathing spontaneously must at least have a three-ply surgical face mask covering their nose and mouth. Patients on uh, an endotracheal tube are uh, transported using a dedicated transport ventilator with an HME filter interposed. Or if we are manually uh, ventilating such patients, we tend to use single-use ammo bags. And the entire path is disinfected with Lysol spray after transfer. Uh, patient handover is an important uh, process. We must limit the number of operators in the COVID operating area. They must all be wearing PPEs before receiving the patient. Uh, the medical case file is preferably left outside the theater so that there is no um, contamination of the file. And it is advised surprisingly that intraoperative anesthetic record documentation be minimized and this should be done after the procedure is done. This is in direct contravention with existing standards of care and many such newer standards uh, I'm going to be highlighting in red in subsequent slides. Uh, it is also advised that we have negative pressure air circulation in the COVID operating area. I was speaking to my maintenance uh, team and they said that uh, our theaters are not configured to de deliver negative pressure air circulation. They said it will be a very expensive and time consuming process trying to convert one air handling unit to deliver negative pressure air circulation. Thankfully, uh, the guidelines that have been emerging later have said that it is all right to have positive pressure air circulation in COVID operating areas, but the caveat is that the air exchange cycles per hour must exceed 25 cycles. So we looked at the COVID operating area and we saw that the air exchange cycle was actually as high as 53 cycles per hour, which is almost one cycle per minute. So that is all right. So I talked about air exchange cycles. The scrub nurse and anesthesia technician must discuss with the surgeon and anesthetist prior to the patient coming and make sure all supplies are present in the theater so that there is minimal or no transit of personnel till the patient leaves the COVID operating area. And as far as possible, disposable drapes and material are preferred. Now, all of these procedures uh, we've been doing uh, at the drop of a hat right from our training days, and we've never really uh, cared about taking too many precautions when we do these procedures. But today, we are told that these are aerosol generating procedures, wherein uh, tiny aerosol droplets less than five microns in diameter are exhaled into the atmosphere and they remain in the ambient atmosphere, the possibility is that they can be inhaled or infect um, healthcare workers in close vicinity. So this is a tracheostomy, a percutaneous dilatational tracheostomy I performed last week in the theater in a post-operative moribund neurosurgical patient. We thought he would be COVID positive, but the report came negative. And to prevent cross-contamination in the ICUs, I made a protocol to perform all percutaneous dilatational tracheostomies in the theater complex and not at the, the patient's bedside. It is said that the senior most anesthetist must intubate the patient. I mean, we are a corporate teaching hospital where we have DNB students, which means that these students 
will get fewer and fewer chances. In the last six weeks, I intubated more patients probably than I did in the last six months put together. It is advisable to put a wet Ganji pad over the mouth and nose of the patient so as to minimize dispersal of aerosol spread while performing pre-oxygenation. Rapid sequence induction is advised. It is said that we must preferably use a video laryngoscope so that there is ample distance between uh, the face of the patient and that of the intubating anesthetist. It is also said that we should not be performing awake intubations, which severely limit your options when you have an anticipated or an unanticipated difficult airway. We need to be using two HME filters, one distal to the catheter mount and the other at the expiratory port of the canister. It is also advised that we change soda line after each case, which tremendously adds to the costs. And what is most damning is that we are told not to use a stethoscope. We are set to, we are asked to confirm bilateral air entry by looking at bilateral chest tries, maybe confirm with an ultrasound, look at the capnogram, and uh, go by the feel of the bag when you do a manual um, ventilation before converting to the ventilator. So today, my stethoscope lies next to me in my car, and I hold it up to show the police when I pass checkpoints while coming to the hospital and going back home. So this is an airway cart, which has an air track. Uh, I'm not very good at using these gadgets, uh, but I must say that all my colleagues are pretty adept at using these. So here you see, um, yours truly trying to perform an intubation uh, by using an aerosol box. Uh, this is an ingenious contraption uh, devised by Amjad and uh, manufactured and uh, marketed by his engineer brother. Uh, thank you Amjad for making this available to us. In the picture on the left, you will see that the ventilator circuit is going through the patient end of this box through this plastic tray. But in the picture on the right, we've reconfigured this particular ventilator circuit to go in through the bronchoscopy port, thereby making this chamber even more airtight. And in the picture on the left, you see here that there is a suction catheter that is connected to uh, make the pressure in the chamber negative. And in the picture on the right, you see that the endotracheal tube has been successfully placed. And this is the bronchoscopy port through which you can also put the gum elastic bougie. Uh, this is the first COVID positive patient that we operated on at our hospital. Uh, this lady was uh, 50 year old. She presented to the ER with respiratory distress and septic shock. She was intubated in the ER. A central line was placed. An art line was placed for direct arterial monitoring. She was on norepinephrine and vasopressin um, infusions. She had a, an infected perforated appendix with a periappendicular abscess. A laparotomy was done. She was intubated three days post-surgery in the RICU and is currently doing quite well. Now, this particular slide is going to raise a lot of eyebrows. I used a different intubation box in this 140 kilo patient yesterday in whom we performed a laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy. I know that uh, I'll have my head on uh, the chopping block later this evening when we have the Q&A session. And I'll try my best to justify why we did this yesterday. Uh, coming to categories of anesthesia, uh, the simplest is MAC with or without oxygen supplementation. If we have to give general anesthesia, it should be with an endotracheal tube with controlled mechanical ventilation only. That is for obvious reasons. And several guidelines state that we should not use supraglottic airways. Sandeep actually said that he bundled them and put them away. But again, there are quite a few um, experiences from people 
emerging worldwide, wherein they have placed supraglottic airways with accompanying muscle relaxation. Neuraxial blocks and uh, peripheral nerve blocks, Sandeep spoke about very comprehensively the day before. As far as maintenance is concerned, lowest possible fresh gas flows to reduce contamination, and we must endeavor to avoid unintentional circuit disconnections. And if we need to intentionally dis, uh, disconnect the circuit, it is best to clamp the endotracheal tube with a forcer. Lung protective ventilatory strategies must be adopted in symptomatic patients in whom the HRCT shows bilateral ground glass peripheral infiltrates uh, of the lower um, lobes. Uh, this is to avoid volutrauma, barotrauma, and also biotrauma. Uh, intravascular volume must be adequate, especially in sicker patients, because they have a tendency to develop acute kidney, kidney injury quite rapidly. Antiemetics, um, optimal analgesia, and smooth emergence uh, go hand in hand when taking care of these patients. Surgical considerations, uh, surgeons sometimes use power drills, burrs, saws, it can throw a mist, but then that is not from the airway, that's from the bone or the muscle or the soft tissue. The same applies to electrocautery or CUSA that the surgeons use some, uh, sometimes for liver surgeries and neurosurgeries. CUSA stands for cavitation ultrasonic aspirator. There is a, a water jet and there is a spray uh, which uh, occurs in the vicinity of uh, uh, the organ that is being operated on. But then if everybody is donning adequate PPEs, that should not be a problem. I've highlighted laparoscopic surgery in red because we are conventionally taught that outcomes are better with laparoscopic surgery. The average length of stay is lesser, patient goes, goes home faster, returns to work faster. And especially as far as oncosurgery is concerned, it is said that laparoscopic surgery tends to reduce the incidence of micrometastatic spread during the surgical procedure. But then today we are told don't do laparoscopic surgeries. But am I sticking to that dictum? In the past week or so, no. We have actually resumed laparoscopic surgeries with abundant caution in the last week or so. Oropharyngeal surgeries, nasal sinus surgeries, needless to mention, are a cause for concern. Um, this is a 70-year-old HCV positive uh, CKD patient on maintenance hemodialysis. Uh, the HRCT chest showed bilateral infiltrates. He came for fixation of a proximal femoral fracture. We placed an N95 mask on this patient. Thankfully, he did not require any oxygen supplementation. And we pulled off this procedure by doing PNS guided lumbar plexus and sacral plexus blocks quite unevenly. Uh, Postoperatively, when there is a um, very low index of suspicion or in a COVID-19 negative patient, or if the HRCT is normal, they can be nursed in FSICU or PACU but all spontaneously breathing patients must wear a mask in the perioperative period to prevent cross-contamination across that unit. And needless to mention, all the staff must be donning adequate level of PPEs. When the index of suspicion is high, or if the patient is tested positive, or requires post-op ventilation, or if the patient has been shifted on ET tube, from the designated respiratory intensive care unit or the ER for surgery, the patient has to be sent back to the designated respiratory intensive care unit for post-op care. In our hospital, uh, this is the uh, policy for disinfection and sterilization of the OT. We frog for 45 minutes with the air circulation on. We use a solution that contains hydrogen peroxide and silver nitrate. We clean walls and doors with uh, Lysol, and no matter who tells you, Lysol is not to be ingested. 
we ensure deep surface cleaning of uh, electro medical equipment with alcohol spray and we make sure that the contact time is at least one minute uh, floors are mopped with this uh, complex sounding solution and the ot is ready for use after 90 minutes uh, these are the various solutions we use for disinfection and sterilization as sandeep alluded to in his talk um, the day before we need to be able to evolve a roadmap for resuming elective surgery once the COVID pandemic begins to ebb and recede. And it is probably correct to be able to take certain baby steps from today itself so that we are prepared for that eventuality if and when it comes. And finally, in conclusion, this was not the first pandemic to test mankind and certainly it will not be the last. While we wait for an effective vaccine to become available, all we need to do is remain positively motivated and adopt the best available clinical practices. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I think uh, we will open the forum for criticism, constructive suggestions, and elective questions. Thank you so much.